Good evening. Um, does anyone know where the phrase paradigm shift comes from? Where it was first used commonly? Has uh, anyone heard of Thomas Kuhn? It's Thomas Kuhn. He wrote a book called The Structure of the Scientific Revolution. Has anyone read it? A few of you. Okay, so if I massively misquote it or get it wrong, apologies to those of you. Everyone else can just sort of bask in my uh, pretended intelligence. The, um, Thomas Kuhn wrote a book called The Structure of the Scientific Revolution. And this was all about how thinking in science changes. And it was about the change from Copernicus to Galileo, about the change from Newton to quantum physics. And what he looked at is how this process from one way of thinking changes into the next, into the next way of thinking. And it's, it's actually a sort of very, very profound and intellectually quite violent change. Uh, because when you have one status quo, an established way of thinking, everyone who is operating at that time works in that way. And when the first person comes along and says that's wrong, or when the cracks in that way of thinking start to appear, everyone dismisses it, or they say it's, a sort of, it's just a blip, or they, they try and rationalise it in some way of the sort of existing thinking. And then when it, as it more tears and tears apart until the new thing comes out, or there is this constant conflict because people just cannot accept that the way that they saw the world could ever be actually wrong. Now, I read this book when I was working in, when I started working in newspapers, I was working at the, the Guardian a while ago, and it was just as the internet was starting to appear. And it was in incredibly, it was exactly what I was seeing, as a whole world was starting to change, and no one could really deal with it. Uh, and it's quite funny because I just, I, was, I did my, my sort of, my, my homework coming here and I was, Jim gave me a Jeremy Grant from his, the, the briefing and there was a, he mentioned a man, a shell geologist in 1958 who said that oil production uh, was going to peak in the US in 1970. And he was one of these early evangelists. Everyone said, you're completely mad. Everyone said, this will not happen. We will continue to grow in exactly the way we have. But of course, that's exactly when it did do. Uh, when it did decline. And when people in sort of at Kodak started to see that film was declining, Kodak invented the first digital cameras. No one at Kodak ever believed that consumers would ever actually like to use anything other than film. And when they first came up with what they called digital photography, digital photography was all about digital devices to let you actually watch your photos, not to take them because they couldn't believe in this enormous installed base of film cameras which made them so profitable and was an entire management team, an entire corporate infrastructure built around creating film to put into cameras and then produce it. They couldn't believe anyone, no one in that business could gear up to the fact that we would all one day buy a digital camera and never use our film camera again. So that when they started to invest in digital, their first big, big play was a device, an incredible device called the, uh, the Photo CD player, which for only $600 allowed you to get a disc of your photos, about 40 photos, put it in and then watch them on your TV. Now, this was meant to be the big saviour, and unfortunately it crashed. And the problem with that is it's not that the technology was bad, it's just the whole solution to the problem had been framed in the current way of dealing with things. So that is one of the great things I saw as I started to write my book. And I noticed the way a whole host of businesses, just as the, as the internet started to, to trundle along, people just couldn't accept that the old way of doing things was coming to an end. Uh, and so I looked in newspapers, my old business, the problem is the evidence is often quite contradictory. The best years ever for newspaper advertising were actually in the peak of the dot-com boom. And why did that happen? It happened because during that time everyone was desperately trying to hire people to work in their dot-com startups. And what did they do? They advertised in newspapers. And so everyone who was sitting in a newspaper going, What's this internet trouble? I see no problem. And of course, a decade later, it's all come and hit. Now, even until about three or four years ago, chief executives of newspaper companies had to go and tell the city that the downturn was a cyclical downturn, not a structural downturn. 
You know, this is all just going to pass in a few years because we are so good. Because look, 20 years ago, we ran an amazing business and there's just been a bit of a problem with the economy, a bit of trouble here and there, but it's all going to come back. And of course, it's never gone. The market capitalization of most newspaper companies is down by about 80 to 90% on the, on the turn of the century. That is terrifying. You know, and it's not just the market caps down, they're all still heavily laden with debt because the city actually invested them really, really heavily during that internet, what internet trouble. So I looked at them, I looked at a fantastic business which we all know and love called Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, Britannica, when the encyclopedia sales started to collapse, they actually thought it was caused by the Gulf War because people always find an excuse. You know, they couldn't do it. They had sales forces equipped with sales literature to explain why the computer would never be as good as the encyclopedia. And they'd sit there and go, well, you can't, you know, you, it would take 150 floppy disks to fit encyclopedia on a, you know, to, uh, on, and you'd never be able to search something as big as Encyclopedia Britannica. And if you search for malt, how would you know if it's a whiskey or anything else? You know, it's, it's, it just is framed in a completely different way. So all these businesses crumble. A lot of them have had a real difficulty. And you know, to, to sort of look at it really, what's happened and what, what's it taken to get, to get through it? Well, I worked with a business called Autotrade, which was part of our group. And they have one of the few businesses that's actually gone from being a tremendously successful print business. Any of you car, car fans? You know Autotrader? Car classifieds, pawned for middle-aged men uh, who don't like porn, obviously, and prefer to look at <laughs> Aston Martins. Um, but it's a, it was a fantastic print business. And the, 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 sort of the executive team there made a very big, bold move in the early days to charge head-on at the internet. They didn't worry about competing with the print business. They launched their internet business. And now they're in, as an internet business with a small print business that's managing, eking through, the profit, eking through its final years, it's actually much more profitable than it ever was before. And they showed the sort of a blueprint that I saw in lots and lots of... Um, I've got one minute left, so I've got to rattle, rattle it off. They've got, I was in sort of lots of places, and it's this. Firstly, what does it take to succeed? It takes leaders who genuinely believe in the need for profound change. It takes leaders who can actually see that this is not a short-term blip, that the, re the requirement is for really radical and profound change. The next thing is it takes people on the ground to actually be able to deliver that change and make it happen. It takes a mix of what I call fixers, rock stars, and fire starters. You need all three of them in the business to really get it going. And the third thing is you need a real ability to be confident about dealing with cannibalization or challenging your core business. And from there, you do two things. You basically transform your core business and you go through that, and then you also build new businesses that will one day take over from your existing one. And the third thing is you innovate madly, but you only do it to help fuel those two. You know, no, no point going off and do your Steve Hilton blue skies thinking. What you want to do is focus on how can we transform the core so it lasts effectively for as long as possible, and how can we find new businesses in the most dynamic and accepting way. Stick to what we do and transform how we do it. And that is my time up. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. I think the um, <clears throat> your mention there of the difference between structural and cyclical is very um, pertinent in, in the green space as well, because you've got commodity prices which have gone up by roughly 40% globally in the last 18 months. And you can argue that's a cyclical change, in which case you don't need to change your business model, or you can see it as a structural change, in which case um, you do. Um, 